Okay, I'm about to uh, give a short, hopefully, hopefully short lecture about uh, my banjo collection. Um, why don't we start out uh, chronologically? The first couple banjos are going to be modern reproductions because the oldest ones uh, either don't exist anymore or they're so expensive as to be prohibitive. Um, so we'll start out. Um, here we go. Back about 1792, uh, somebody in South Carolina did a um, watercolor which happened to show what a banjo of the time looked like. And uh, thanks to a luthier friend of mine and, uh, and the person behind the camera, we ended up building a reproduction. So 1792, banjo would have been made out of a gourd, uh, would have been tack head, um, three and a half strings, and uh, uh, simple melodies with, with that few strings. So um, we don't really know what the tunings were or what tunes. Uh, unfortunately, no one seems to have recorded that. Or mention that in any of the books. But that's pretty much what the banjo looked like uh, roughly about uh, 1800. Um, so we're gonna, in this uh, little video, we're gonna be going through the whole 19th century pretty much. So 1800. Now that would have been a slave instrument at the time. Um, long about 1835-1840, a guy by the name of Joel Walker Sweeney um, did the next improvement on banjos. He took, uh, he took uh, the top of the uh, bucket, basically, pail, and he cut it off and he added uh, a large skin to it, tack heads. And he also added the uh, fourth string, so you could get better, more complex melodies. And uh, these were made, a lot of them, by a guy in, in New York City by the name of uh, William Esperance Boucher. And, um, and he improved it even more a few years later because he was initially a drum maker. So basically he ended up making it look like a drum. In fact, some of them even had two heads, top and bottom, just like a drum would. And that's pretty much the banjo that uh, the minstrel troops took to Europe, uh, went across uh, country and around the horn to the uh, gold rush of 49, and the gold rush of 52 in Australia, and basically all around the world. This is the type of banjo that a lot of the contemporary uh, Civil War photos of soldiers, they show them playing something like this. And um, that's, so we're up to about 1845 with this. Okay. Eighteen forty-seven. We've got a guy in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. This is another modern reproduction. Pottsville, Pennsylvania, which is hard to say even. Um, who built these? He built two of them that we know of, so they're very rare. Um, Henry Stichter. And uh, what's interesting about the way he built these is instead of uh, one big piece of wood for the neck. Uh, he actually has one piece here, second piece here, third piece bolted on for the fifth peg, um, and, a, and a whole separate piece for the rim stick. So very different construction style. Um, there we go. So that's almost up to 1850. 
And now we're going to get an actual 1850-ish banjo. Um, and this I'd like to bring in a little bit to show. Um, this came from Nova Scotia of all places. Uh, it's an American-made banjo. The neck is pre-Civil War, so pre-1860. Uh, you can tell that by the position of the fifth peg, by the uh, amorphous shape of the peg head, um, and by the orientation of the fifth peg, which is not the modern uh, orientation that would come out. What's kind of interesting about this is the pot here is later, it's probably 1870-ish. So at some point somebody put a new pot on this. Um, I was lucky enough to get it. Uh, and the great thing about this is it's got American uh, shields there and uh, stars there engraved into the uh, pegged, or rather into the uh, fretboard. So that is an actual 1850 era banjo, or at least the neck is. Next banjo is roughly from 1860-ish, start of the Civil War. Um, comes from New York, New York State. Many of these banjos, in fact most of them, uh, came from northern cities. Uh, they were industrial uh, cities that were able to uh, produce a number of banjos in the factory settings. Um, we know this is as old as we think it is because of the hardware, type of nut, uh, the type of shoe holding the hook in place, uh, the old orientation of the neck, very light banjo, um, uh, probably made in New York City from the looks of it. Originally it was painted black, the, the rim stick still is. I believe that's walnut, I'm not sure. Um, fun banjo to play. Alright, I'm back. Alright, this banjo is from roughly 1870. And you'll notice I'm not giving actual dates on this because these earlier banjos did not have serial numbers. And really, you pretty much have to guess, make educated guesses as to how old they are. Um, so you base it on uh, construction methods and um, uh, the type of hardware and the orientation of fifth peg and where the fifth peg is and all that good stuff. So anyway, this is a minstrel banjo. It's probably... 1870-ish. Got a nice big scoop there. Um, and the big feature on this is the uh, American Eagles all around the side. Which, uh, when I bought this, I thought that might help identify it. And it turns out that was an aftermarket feature that people would get and uh, make their banjos more interesting. Um, so there's a lot of banjos with uh, American Eagles on it, and there's no way of telling who made them. Uh, most of these are made either in New York or Baltimore, or northern industrial towns of the 19th century. Um, fifth peg is uh, not quite in the modern orientation. It's a little bit farther down the neck. Um, or the position of the fifth peg is farther down than it would be in a modern banjo. Um, interesting peg head shape. Uh, I don't know how old the head is, but it's an older head. Could be original, I don't know. So like I say, roughly 1870-ish. Uh, beautiful, beautiful banjo and a nice sound to it. Um, So that would have been about five years after the Civil War. And this one here is from about, uh, probably about 1875. Um, so it's a little bit different. It doesn't have a scoop. 
it uh, has the more modern orientation of the fifth peg. Real nice, sort of a, I'd call that a cherry finish. Um, and again, it's got the American Eagles, but if you look at the ones right where the neck comes in, they're upside down, which shows you that this didn't come out of the factory that way. I call this the Dead Eagle Banjo because of that. Um, but remarkably good shape for, uh, for being from roughly 1875. Um, interesting rim stick here. It looks like it's actually a piece of furniture. Um, and this banjo actually came with a Civil War connection. Uh, when I got it, there was a sticker on the, or a piece of paper on the back that uh, mentioned uh, a Civil War soldier from the Rhode Island Regiment. And um, so I'm assuming that uh, sometime after the Civil War, he bought a banjo. It's kind of fascinating. Anyway, a nice uh, brass to finger on this up here. Fun banjo to play. All right, let's see. I'm trying to figure out the, which one to, to pick up now. I guess I'll do this one. This is from 1867. Uh, Henry Dobson, one of the Dobson brothers in New York City. Um, uh, this was the banjo he manufactured. He had a couple other patents in, uh, in 1873 and 1877, I believe. And so this being the earlier one, we know it's uh, somewhere between 1867 and 1873. Interesting banjo. It was top tension. Um, and also it had a built-in uh, built resonator. And um, not entirely sure he came up with that idea, but he certainly popularized it. Um, resonators didn't get popular with ban in, uh, for banjos until about 1915, so he really was ahead of his time. Um, these were made by uh, uh, the Dobson, well, the Buckbee Company in New York City made a lot of banjos for a lot of different people. But uh, this is what Henry Dobson did for about 10 years, all through the 1870s. I've got another one that is a bit of an enigma because it's got the wrong neck. We don't know why it's got a non-Dobson neck. Um, same basic body style, but I have no idea why that neck is on there. At some point it must have uh, been changed. So that brings us up to the mid-1870s. Let's see. one's a throwback. It's actually a, a tack head. Supposedly about 1880 uh, and uh, the reason they were still building these in 1880 is because they were cheap. So these were marketed uh, as the cheapest banjos in catalogs for kids. Um, very light banjo. So also right about 1880, we got an interesting banjo here with uh, some really pretty marquetry on it. Um, I don't know if you can get that whole thing in there. It's got a butterfly up here. A good friend of mine re restored this for me. Um, uh, don't know what to say other than it's really beautiful and I really lucked out. Uh, getting the uh, the uh, winning the auction, put a new head on it. Um, 
like I say, a friend of mine restored the uh, marquetry and uh, plays really well. So, 1880, interesting banjo to, uh, to have. Also, probably right around 1880, uh, a, a bottom tension banjo, uh, as opposed to the top tension one I had over there. Um, can't be absolutely certain of the date. I'm just going by the, uh, looks like a, another Buck B style neck. And um, latter half of the 19th century had a lot of banjo um, patents. A lot of people trying to improve the banjo. A lot of ideas that didn't go anywhere, which is kind of what happened with this one. Um, cool little banjo, though. You know, in the event of an earthquake, this would be a real mess. <laughs> All right, getting back to Henry Dobson. By the 1880s, he had abandoned the um, heavier banjo that had the rim uh, or the uh, resonator, and he went with a more modern-looking banjo. Um, yeah, he also seems to be the one that came up with the idea of a tone ring which uh, a lot of modern banjos have uh, to this day. Um, interesting sort of boat shape, uh, or it's called a boat heel, I think. Um, and he sort of refined the um, peg head shape. He had had earlier with that one, and he sort of made it a little bit smaller, and uh, I happen to like the earlier one, I think it's more artistic. All right. Um, so what happened with that last one from the early 1880s, you noticed it was what they call silver clad, which is silver on top of, or polished brass on top of um, a wooden pot. And from here on in, most of the banjos in the 1880s and 90s and beyond had that, it's brass that's silver plated actually. Um, and this one came from Chicago. It's a cup, Cupley was the manufacturer. You could tell that by the very unique uh, tailpiece. And um, instead of American Eagles, he had little shields, American shields on there. Um, very simple banjo, very inexpensive banjo, was not in very good shape at all. Um, my friend uh, Kate and I learned how to do, um, put on a skin head on this, uh, on this one. And uh, it had fret markers instead of frets. Uh, frets really only came into use in, uh, in, the, in the 1880s, they're about for the most part. Um, so, simple banjo, inexpensive banjo, but kind of fun to play. Alrighty, let's see. So this little guy, very heavy, it's a little, it's called a banjarine. It was invented by uh, Samuel Swain Stewart, the Stewart Company, Philadelphia, PA. Um, and uh, probably late 1880s, is, it could be as late as 1893, judging from the type of, uh, from the pattern of inlay. Um, these are called uh, heel crackers because of all the tension. These were way up there as far as the tuning is generally way up at high C. I keep it down to A so that a 
a regular banjo just has to capo, capo to the second fret. Um, you don't really see many of these anymore because uh, the tension was so bad that the, the heel tended to split. Um, very heavy banjo uh, for being that small. A lot of fun to play though. Very large uh, head on there. Um, and interesting, interestingly enough, uh, I had to replace the head. And unlike most banjos where the rim stick is connected to the neck, uh, it's not with this. The whole thing comes off. Basically the rim stick is just keeping this from collapsing in on itself because of all the tension. So that is a Stuart Banjarine. I like Stewart's. The first banjo I ever had was a Stewart. This is called the American Princess. Uh, probably mid 1880s. Um, these were marketed to women, Victorian ladies who couldn't be expected to carry a big heavy banjo around. Um, and uh, I think they were like 20 bucks when they first came out. Um, and I paid more than that. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, I do like Stewart's. They, they always have a really good sound to me. Um, unlike the Dobson that had a tone ring, Stewart never believed in a tone ring. So uh, that's one of the things that dis distinguishes the two. Stewart was based in Philadelphia. I don't know if I mentioned that. There's another Stewart universal favorite model. Uh, I believe it's 18, mid 1890s, probably about 1895. Um, again, metal clad, wooden pot. Has a, a smaller uh, adjustable uh, thing here rather than the big heavy one that was on the uh, Banjarine. Brace is the word. It wasn't a thing. It's a brace. Um, and you can see some of the really pretty inlay that uh, Stuart was known for up in the peg head in the first couple frets. Um, like I say, I'm partial to Stuart's. I think they're uh, a really wonderful banjo. Um, Also built by a Stewart. Uh, this is from 1901, but he was under contract to Sears, and uh, for those banjos, they called them Acme banjos. And uh, between 1893 and 1901, this was in the Sears catalog. Although the very best one was the last one, 1890 or 1901. Um, I think it was called the University. University Glee model banjo. It's got a tree of life on it. And I like to compare that to this because you can see in a hundred years, 1800 and basically 1900, uh, the banjo had gotten a lot more complex, a lot heavier, some beautiful heel carving. Um, and uh, basically a hundred years of evolution right there. Uh, pretty graphically illustrated, I think. Um, Also in the 1890s, backtracking a bit. Like I said, they use a lot of, there was a lot of innovation, a lot of patents uh, in the uh, latter part of the 19th century for improving the banjo. This is one of the more unusual ones. It's basically combining the idea of a banjo neck 
with uh, pretty much a mandolin body. Um, this idea was actually brought back by, uh, I want to say, Gold Tone. Uh, they have a banjola, and, uh, but it's based on this. Um, probably from about 1893 or 4. Um, sounds kind of somewhat like a dulcimer, somewhat like a banjo. Very quiet sounding compared to a regular banjo. This is what's called a cello banjo. It was actually homemade. Uh, couldn't afford, um, I think the cheapest one I've seen is 700 and uh, they go up to three or 4,000. I think I paid about 100 for this. Uh, my friend Eric Prust out in uh, Squim uh, helped me with this. And uh, uh, it's tuned a whole octave lower than a regular banjo. And, uh, and it's out of tune at the moment, but it's definitely deep and, and uh, gives a whole different feeling than a regular banjo as far as tone and uh, volume. Moving right, right along. It's a mountain banjo, sort of. Uh, a different branch of the banjo family. Um, and we don't have accurate uh, information on these. It's kind of controversial uh, how far back they went. The story has always been that uh, Civil War soldiers saw banjos when they went down south, and then they came back up north and decided to build banjos. Um, didn't have a lot of wood, a lot of metal on their farms, and uh, decided to make them out of wood. The problem with that is there's no 19th century pictures showing somebody playing one of these. Earliest picture that uh, I've come across is about 1915. So you can either believe the oral history, which says it goes back to the Civil War, or you can believe the photographic evidence which seems to say somebody in North Carolina or Tennessee came up with this idea first decade or two of the, uh, 19, uh, the 20th century. Anyway, this one probably comes from about the 1930s. Um, I've got several others that are modern. The, uh, this comes from 1976. A friend of mine made it for me. And uh, it kind of got popular again after a series of books came out in the 1970s called the Foxfire Books. Uh, and uh, they had plans in those books. And uh, Every one I have, I've got two or three others, and every one is, is made a little bit differently, but it's all basically the same idea. And then just for the heck of it, I'll show you something else. Uh, when I was researching this, uh, I came across the idea on the internet of somebody who had taken a wooden bowl and made a gourd banjo out of the bowl. So... Uh, Again, my friend Eric up uh, north um, helped me out with this and made a really nice neck for it. And uh, it's essentially a gourd banjo, but with a wooden bowl, which I got a Goodwill for, I think, $1.99. <laughs> and then there's variations on that theme. Um, We found out it's a lot easier to use, to make a banjo from a wooden bowl with that that has uh, flat sides, and uh, it's kind of made an interesting looking neck based on some 19th century banjos I saw. The next banjo I want to show um, is from about 1879. The uh, I found a patent 
a fellow by the name of McManus who came up with a unique idea of a two-piece banjo hook that didn't require any holes drilled through this. Um, kind of a cool idea. The bottom piece hooks around the bottom and then the top piece is just similar to the way they normally would be. Um, I had to get those made by uh, a guy in, in uh, Pennsylvania by the name of Mark Ralston. Good guy. Anyway, when I found this, it was in pieces and had no holes, like I said, so wasn't quite sure how to deal with it at first until I discovered that patent. Um, my friend Eric, uh, long-suffering Eric up in Squim, Washington, helped uh, help me put it together. I believe my friend Kate helped me put the head on. And uh, probably for the first time in about 130 years, it's playable. So, kind of a fun, heavily built banjo, 1879, 1880, right, right around in there. Uh, Another one of the banjo ideas, banjo patents, that did not go anywhere. Um, There's hundreds of those in the, in the uh, 19th century. Uh, probably the reason it didn't go anywhere is because these, since they weren't actually attached, they got lost. Um, but other than that, it's kind of a cool idea. So that is, I like the way the, uh, the shape of the peg head as well. Anyway, neat banjo, um, a lot of fun to play. Um, I think what I want to do now is show you what some of these banjos look like when I first get them, because in a lot of cases they haven't been played or, or have been in pieces for well over a century. Um, this next one was um, patented and uh, made by uh, guy whose last name is Andres, and the patent was from 1894. Kind of a fascinating banjo that's going to take some work to get it playable. Um, the uh, tone ring is a very heavy piece of metal, has holes all around the sides, to let the uh, let the sound out. It's a bottom tension banjo, so the um, the hooks go th go through from the bottom and then wrap around the top. Um, this is going to take a lot of work. Uh, a friend of mine who who does this sort of thing for me uh, mentioned several years. It's going to need a brand new uh, fretboard. We'll save the old inlays. It's going to need new veneer at the peg head. It's going to need pegs. Uh, obviously, a, a new head. There's some veneer missing here. Um, it's going to be an interesting banjo when it's playable. Like I say, I wouldn't be surprised if this uh, has not been played in about a century. Um, like, like I said, the patent was 1894. Um, talked to a, a nationally known banjo expert who said he, he knows of one other one. So there may be more than two, but I, I, I doubt if, if there's a lot more than two. Um, another one of the many banjo ideas from the 19th century that didn't go anywhere. Probably too complicated to man manufacture. Anyway, fascinating banjo. Get back to me in about two, two, three years, and uh, it might be playable. Okay. So that's the banjo collection. Um, I call it the Visa collection because uh, so much of it was paid for and is still being paid for to uh, to Visa. Um, kind of my method of operation has always been uh, buy them unplayable and then try and fix them up and, and uh, get them playable and uh, 
try and play every last one of them. Anyway, thank you for watching and uh, play, play some tunes.